Ambassador Tanmay Lal, um, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. I want to thank my friend Swami for inviting me to this wonderful gathering here at Alma Dolan. Um, it's great. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Uva, who really very beautifully showed us uh, this beautiful medieval town of Visby. Uh, it's, it's really, I, I love the perspectives that you brought yesterday, so thank you very much. To begin with, I do want to tell you that I come from a place called Pune. Uh, Pune is about 100 miles from Mumbai, and it is home to a few Swedish companies that started way back in the 60s. And um, they have their Indian headquarters based out of Pune. So Pune is, or Sweden, is not unknown to many businesses in India. As many of the speakers have said, Sambandh means connections or relationship, both in Hindi as well as in Swedish. So there's a lot of connection, seems to be a lot of connection between the two countries. As we all know, uh, we're talking today about Sambandh for climate. And we all know that, some, uh, that climate is the most pressing issue that is on our hands today. It knows no borders. It impacts every living being on our planet. It's threatening ecosystems, biodiversity, food security, and the livelihoods of millions of people world over. Many of us may have heard about something called the boiled frog syndrome. So the boiled frog syndrome is when you put a, a frog in boiling water, it will jump out immediately. But if you put a frog in water and then slowly heat the water, the frog won't know that it's boiling and it's too late. Similarly with climate change. Unfortunately, the prioritization of profit over everything else, as well as certain government policies that haven't been thought through, has fueled unsustainable consumption and climate change. We must recognize the signs and act collectively before it is too late. Both Sweden and India are exemplifying proactive efforts in this regard. Each have their unique strengths and their challenges, whether it is progressive environmental policies, investing in renewable energy like wind and solar, or starting to think about decarbonization of hard to abate industries. Sweden's commitment to sustainability serves as a beacon for everyone across the world. They aim to reduce their environmental footprint include companies like Radscan, Navion, Vattenfall, Ericsson, Scania, of course, the famous IKEA that we all know of, that integrates sustainability into its operations. Sourcing renewable energy for promoting sustainable practices throughout their supply chain. There are also companies like Renova, Helsingborg, Gothenburg Energy, and many more that lead in district heating and cooling, and are now transitioning towards biofuels to cut greenhouse gases. On the other hand, India is, as you all know, is the world's most populous country. It's developing very rapidly, but we face a triple challenge. One is the challenge of economic growth, with millions of people trying to come out of poverty, and so the needs of all these people over time. The second is environmental concerns, and the third is energy security. It's not an easy problem for any developing country to contend with, especially India, that imports 80% of its energy with oil imports, and yet, ironically, is sitting on the world's second largest coal reserves. However, it has made significant strides in expanding renewable energy, promoting energy efficiency measures, launching measures like the International Solar Mission, the Hydrogen Mission, 
and many others. By the way, today, in fact, most hydrogen produced today is produced, as most of us know, by fossil fuels. Gas in the Western world, coal gasification in China. But of course, it will change, hopefully, with the cost of electrolyzers coming down rapidly. We also need to think of a fair or a just transition. Since today, millions of people derive their income in India from coal, both directly, directly in the coal sector, and indirectly through the railways. Railways get majority of their income in India by transporting coal from one place to another. So there are millions of people that get their livelihoods through coal. We will need to think of innovative ways to engage with, to retrain them, to upskill them, uh, to see how we can get their livelihoods to be continued over time. India will reach its non-fossil energy capacity of 500 gigawatts by 2030. As Mayank said, 50% of our electricity requirement will come from renewables by 2030. We also plan to produce 5 million metric tons of hydrogen by then. The government has presently mandated 1% of bio-CNG, which is the compressed biogas, with natural gas, for mobility as well as for our own city gas. But that will go up to 5% by the year 2930, and much more. So there is a lot of momentum that is gathering towards the green transition. Maybe this is a good idea, a good time for me to introduce our own company, which is Thermax. Our motto from the 70s has been conserving energy preserving the environment. We recently changed it to conserving resources, preserving the future. Because it's not just energy that we need to conserve, it's a lot of other resources, including water. When we began in the 60s, we started as a boiler company. In fact, our first collaboration was with a Belgian company called Wonson. When the uh, collaboration ended in 1980, we changed the name from Wonson India to Thermax. Over the years, we've moved from boilers to water and wastewater treatment, to air pollution control, chemicals. Uh, we've, we do a lot of waste to energy, and we also do power plants. Today, we are a trusted partner to industries, helping them with their customized energy transition needs. Producing clean energy, clean water, and clean air. And I'd like to give you three examples in the context of our tagline, which is conserving resources, preserving the future. We're a very application-oriented company. So the first example I'll give you, and Mayank talked a little bit about it with regard to rice. In North India, farmers grow rice as a kharif or a monsoon crop. They sow seeds in June, and they harvest in October. Post-harvesting, they burn the rice straw, which is called stubble burning, since they only have a few weeks before they can plant the next crop, which is the rabi or the winter crop. Due to this burning, pollution levels are crazy in the north of India for a few months, giving rise to a lot of diseases, especially lung diseases. And strangely, on the other hand, this rice straw has a fantastic opportunity where it can be converted into bio-CNG or compressed biogas. And this is a green fuel that, as I mentioned earlier, can be used both for mobility as well as for city gas. And that's how we also reduce our dependence on imports. The byproduct that is generated is also an organic fertilizer so you need less and less chemical fertilizer in the soil. However, converting this rice straw into bio-CNG is not easy. There are a number of techno technology challenges. Thermax is currently working on this at the moment, and if there's any company 
that has some knowledge of this, we'd love to partner with you to see how to crack this. Because once we crack this, it would be really, uh, really great, great. It would be really great for humanity as well as uh, for India. We're also presently converting cow dung, press mud, as well as municipal solid waste into bio-CNG. Another very innovative application that we've come out with is the potato chip frying industry. So this industry is a guzzler for water. We've worked with a large MNC in India that uses seven liters of water for every one kilogram of potato chips fried. And we've done a water audit with them and found that we can reduce 85% of the water usage. So now they use one liter of water for every kilogram of potato chips fried. <clears throat> We've also found that when you fry potato chips, there's something called volatile organic compounds that comes out, that are generated. And these volatile organic compounds contain energy. So we actually take the energy from there and convert it into cooling. And there is cooling that is needed in the potato chip industry because for packaging, you need a cooling environment in order to keep the potato chips crisp. And so in, in some ways, it's like a circularity. Yeah, so it's working in uh, completely end to end. Another interesting application, many European countries utilize waste for district heating and of course now even for district cooling. Thermax has worked with many utility packagers in Scandinavia and in many other European countries. In fact, it's uh, in Uppsala, in Sweden, your low and medium grade heat, which is generated from waste, household and industrial waste, powers two of Thermax's heat pumps. The same units produce hot water for district heating in winter and chilled water for cooling in summer. And we've supplied about 10 or 12 of them in Sweden, as well as a, a number of chillers for, the Swedish, for uh, Sweden. We're also turning waste into wealth using RDF, which is refuse-derived fuel. And this is burnt in our boilers, supplying multiple units, again through Swedish and various Scandinavian contractors to Norway and other Scandinavian countries through our company Dan Stoker in Denmark. So it really feels good to see that we are partnering with customers, helping them reduce carbon emissions, helping them convert waste into some form of value, as well as reducing the quantum of water. And I'm sure that there are many, many collaborations or partnerships possible between India and Sweden in the areas of technology, research, and bilateral trade for clean energy, clean air, and clean water. Just another thought that I had for Sambandh, for climate, between Sweden and India, could be education and skilling for green jobs. The skills that we're going to need are going to be very, very different to what skills are needed today. Whether it's hydrogen, whether it's carbon capture, whether it's solar, wind, architects and environmental consultants will need new skills when creating low energy buildings. It's not just about plumbing and masonry, but tomorrow project managers are going to be able to have to learn to, to get drones working in order to see projects completed. Electricians will have to be taught on how to maintain and install solar panels, solar water pumps in villages. Petrol pump attendants will have to know how to fill in or get electricity charged into an EV. Scandinavian school education, especially I'm told Finland, but I'm sure in Sweden too, is known to be one of the best in the world. India, on the other hand, has a huge challenge with regard to school education and needs fixing. Talking about scale, 
uh, we have 250 million children at school at any point in time. How do we make them future ready? When they pass out from, from school or college 10, 15, 20 years from now, the world is going to be a very, very different place to what it is today. How do we really equip them to be continuous learners, to give them 21st century skills, rather than making them rote learners just to pass exams? Is there an opportunity for Sweden and India to work together to build some of these skills, to build agency in our children so that they can face the changing world of tomorrow? Something for us to really think about. When I started, I spoke about the motive of profit over all else, which has led to unsustainable consumption. However, over time, it's good to see that there are many, many companies that are incorporating profit, purpose, and planet into their long-term strategies. And I'd like to end with something that my father really believed and constantly worked towards, which is that profit is not a set of figures, but of values. Thank you. Thank you. So beautifully put, uh, Meher. Thank, Thank you so you. much for that. Uh, and I'm going to pick up on the, you know, on the last bit that you talked about uh, balancing planet, people, and profit. Um, how how do you go about it at Thermax, for example? I think um, I'll pick on what Mayank said. Actually, it's it starts with the mindset. It's actually all about the mindset, and it's about the mindset at the top of the organization to begin with. Yeah, so uh, whether it's the, the ownership, whether it's the board, the second executive line, how do we all really think about planet, purpose, and profit uh, together? And I think, uh, and, and that's how it started in, in Thermax, and as I mentioned, conserving energy, preserving the environment. Uh, has been our motto since the 70s. And so in some ways, planet and purpose went hand in hand, even at that time. Um, and just, just to let you know that neither my father nor my grandfather, who started the company, were engineers. But they started a company that was purely engineering. And they managed to do this because they really got very good people whom they empowered, they gave a lot of freedom to. Um, people were allowed or encouraged to make mistakes. And so I think the whole idea of innovation, application engineering, thinking out of the box started there. So that's how the people element, the planet, and the purpose sort of mixed together. And I'd also say, I think, I think when the going is good, it's fine. But I think it's some of those important decisions that sort of come to a level where you have to step back and say, ah, do I want my purpose and planet or do I want profit? And I'll give you one example. About uh, 15 years ago, um, we decided to start a business called um, a build own operate business where we were selling steam rather than selling a boiler. Yeah. And um, it came to the board that let's start this. And uh, I remember us thinking about it and saying, if we start it as a business which can use any fuel and then you sell the steam, the business can be huge and we can make a massive profit. But I remember having this dialogue and saying, but don't we want to really think about the planet and about environment? And um, this is the time that we have to really take a decision whether our purpose is important or not. And we took a decision at that time that we will stick only to green. And that was 15 years ago. We may have lost a lot of business, but today I think it's proved to be the right decision. 
It's a hard decision, no doubt, Meher, because yeah. uh, balancing, I think, for any corporate or any industry, uh, profitability, the sort of the uh, bottom line with the with people, with uh, the future of the company as well. Mm -hmm. So very interesting story, and I'm glad you shared this. If I can ask you a very, very quick question, one sure, more. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, but you you spoke about climate action and about building up a green economy, and you spoke up. You gave some examples. Uh, and um, what role does green engineering play in enabling this transition for building a next generation economy, for for example? So sort of a next generation of uh, industry, of business opportunities, and of uh, of a next generation of young minds who are then innovating. I mean, there's a lot happening at universities in terms of green en green engineering. Um, whether I mean, today, for example, um, someone whom Mayank and I know in Pune, Mr. Pradeep Bhargava, is leading a phenomenal initiative called Green Co, which is uh, certifying green energy, green companies, or companies that are greening their factories. So there are different certifications, you know, like the bronze, silver, gold, platinum certifications that you get when your factory becomes clean, cleaner and greener. To do that, you have to have green engineering skills. So that's coming into the market now. Um, there, are, there is waste to energy, a lot of thinking on waste to energy. Architects, builders are thinking about how to use materials that are greener, that are cleaner, um, where there is some sort of circularity, you know, where we're not throwing away things, where we're reusing and recycling. So I think green engineering is really something that is developing hugely uh, all over the world at the moment. Thank you so much, Meher. And uh, some, some of the points that you raised, in fact, we do have uh, people from uh, academia as well as industry who will later in the day be sharing uh, more on green, en green engineering, including building material, including uh, on food. Uh, so we do have like uh, some of these examples right here, which Great. we would love to share with our audience Thank as you. well. But lovely having you here. Thank you Thanks so much, Meher. Thank Patanji. you. Thank you.